Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a conversation with my friends. And today I have with me here as usual, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my gosh, you guys. <laughs> um, we are uh, we are so happy to see so many of our friends here today. Welcome, Fox and Bear. Welcome, Rar. Actually, uh, should I keep calling you Rar on the stream? I know I call you another name in um, in the other Discord. Uh, tell me if I should just switch to your other name. And welcome in, Jane. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Jane. So happy to see you here. Ah, Listening while um, I bop around the house. Yes, yeah, Saturday is chore day. You are more than welcome to listen to us while you go do your house stuff. Um, so I am doing good today. I hope you guys are all doing good. How are you doing today, Landon? I'm doing good. I'm fighting off a cold. So if my voice gives out halfway through, well, forgive me. <laughs> Hopefully it won't. Hopefully we'll be okay. But yeah, no, we'll poor Landon um, felt a cold coming on this morning, of course. Yes, exclamation Landon. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. But other than that, I'm all good. Things, oh, things are God. looking up and we get to talk about Sailor Moon, which as we know from the last few streams, I absolutely adore. So yes, yes, it's like it's like um, Landon doesn't like anime, but she but Sailor Moon is like her favorite anime. <laughs> it's, I it's queer, it's niche girl power, mm -hmm. and it's pretty. I don't mm -hmm. know what you would hate about this, right? Exactly. It's true. It's true. So so yes. Yeah, so we are talking today about Sailor Moon Eternal. Right. So what is Sailor Moon Eternal? Tell everybody a little bit of introdu introduction of what we're going to be talking about. Well, Sailor Moon Eternal is the first movie from the reboots. Uh, we will be expecting another movie this upcoming summer. So summer 2023. This came out in the height of COVID, I believe, in 2021. And uh, it's a fun little Sailor Moon movie that's split into two parts. So really, it's like two long episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah kind of kind of it is um and, and uh, gonna, we'll talk about it yes yeah, so we're gonna go all through it and but before we do i want to show you guys something i showed this off on the thursday stream but for those guys that you that didn't see look i had some mock-ups of some stickers made and uh and these are just kind of like samples so these aren't going to be sold but i am really happy with the quality so i am going to make some versions that we're actually going to sell but it, but until we get to that point Look, I have a bunch of sticker packs to give away. So we're going to be slowly giving those away between um, now and and uh, probably uh, the end of the month, probably all throughout October. So for today, if you would like to win a sticker pack, exclamation stickers, we would love to know what your favorite Sailor Moon movie is. And then um, at the end of the stream, we'll look at everybody who answered and we'll do a little fun um, drawing. So, uh, so let me know your favorite Sailor Moon movie. And if you don't remember which, uh, which Sailor Moon things are movies, don't worry, we're going to remind you uh, in just a couple of slides. So, uh, so you will know and let us know your favorite Sailor Moon movie and uh, I'll be more than happy to send you a pack of stickers. All right. So um, that being said, oh sorry, go ahead, Landon. I was gonna say it's October miss. We're getting we're giving gifts. It's October miss or Halloween miss. <laughs> yes, and uh, and if all My goes according holiday. to plan, and if all goes according to plan, then um you will be able to purchase these stickers uh, around Christmas time. So that goes. Yes. How many movies um, were there? There were three. There were three uh, main movies from the main Sailor Moon anime. And then, of course, there is Eternal, which is is a movie as well. That's the one we're going we're gonna to talk about today. So it four feels, total. It definitely felt like more. It definitely, like, as a kid, like, I was like, man, everything was a Sailor Moon movie. But we'll go into that <laughs> here in a bit. But before yes. we get ahead of ourselves and talk about the movies, let's talk about some of our favorite things from Sailor Moon Eternal. So yes. Karen, all right, is the slideshow up? I just want to make yes, sure. Yes, yes, slideshow is up. Then, okay. Karen, would you please tell everybody what your favorite thing was? Yes, okay. So like most arcs of Sailor Moon, it starts out with villains that kind of match the individual Sailor Scouts going and um, attacking them in one way or another. And usually... Um, Amy's section, Sailor Mercury's section, is a little bit predictable. I mean, it's cute, you know, like I like Amy, but it's like she's involved in a chess competition and, you know, some like nerdy things like that. But what's great about the dream arc, and I love this adaptation of it, 
is that we get to meet Amy's mom and we actually get to find out a lot of background information of why her dream is to eventually become a doctor and be part of the medical field. You see that um, she is raised by a single mother. Her father was quite um, fun loving and, you know, believed that there was a little bit more to life than just good grades. You know, maybe excellence is not the only thing in life. And uh, it gives this insight into Amy's character and why she is somebody that is so driven to succeed uh, compared to the other Sailor Scouts that was only implied before. Like it wasn't explicit, especially not in Sailor Moon Crystal. And then plus, the villain that attacks her is Fisheye, one of the best villains in all of Sailor Moon. Uh, love Fisheye in Crystal, loved Fisheye in the original anime, love Fisheye in the manga. I think Fisheye's, uh, every adaptation of Fisheye is just like excellent. You yes. know what I mean? Love, love, love. They just, they, got, they like just get hotter with age. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> like I remember being like, man, these villains, they rule. And then here I'm like, man, they're hot. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we love we love and so i just think i think like amy's little segment um of you know getting attacked and and, and seeing this is uh is really particularly good um now we're going to talk about of course um a, a little bit about each of the sailor scouts and their little their little uh, character development episodes in the context of everything but i just wanted to highlight this one because i think it's just it's just particularly good, and it's particularly good in most adaptations, but Crystal really um, does a very good job of understanding the essence of like why this moment is particularly important for Amy's character development. You see a lot of like little glimpses of uh, Amy's mother and Amy's father that are very enriching to her character. Yeah. I also think that there's something nice about... Uh... Like we've seen this over and over again, where the scouts get paired with a villain that is kind of a mirror of them. And like, that's the, that's the formula that comes into a Sailor Moon season at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be four seasons in doing the same thing and then doing it exceptionally well is really unique. And that's something we'll talk about when we get to the villains, but that definitely like adds to both showing the development of her character, but also a deeper understanding because there's a villain that matches her that way. And I really like it. Yeah, exactly. So. I, to I I just, I think it's a really good one. And it's towards the beginning. So it's kind of like this nice little, um, nice opener of Sailor yes. Moon Eternal. So it's really, really good. Sets the stage. That's my favorite thing from um, Sailor Moon Eternal. Landon, what is your favorite thing? Listen, I love me a rainbow uh, horse boy. <laughs> I just... Chibi Yusa, we've talked about how much I love her. She was like, Dark Lady was my favorite thing for season two. Chibi Yusa was my favorite thing for season three. And then we get her future boyfriend for season four slash the movie. Uh, and I was just like, man, this is a wholesome boy who's just so dedicated to his mission that he doesn't see that the obvious love of his life is right in front of him just many years younger <laughs> uh and it truly he's like I just I love his character and I remember when I was a kid loving his character uh I used to for those of you who didn't who didn't know this uh whenever I played Sailor Moon with me and my friends I liked to be you know Sailor Scout Earth uh who was you know Mamaru's sister and that was like involved Helios and stuff like that during that time too so it was a whole lore for us but I loved it and I loved seeing him return mm -hmm. yeah, and I think Helios in this particular um adaptation is particularly good he gets quite a lot of screen time in um, Sailor Moon Eternal, there is there's a lot that goes on between himself and uh, and Chibiusa. He is he is not only a tragic and interesting character. He also holds a lot of the key information. So he he does a lot of the info dumping as well. Um, basically, if you love Helios, Sailor Moon Crystal delivers all of the key Helios moments yes. that you love from the manga and from the '90s anime. Uh, it's great, really, really great version of the character cute and just a cute little thing we'll talk about the relationship a bit but it's a mm -hmm. nice little flash forward and a little like I don't know it's their their relationship's very innocent and a reminder of like what Mamoru and Usagi used to be so it's like a fun mm -hmm. little flashback 
All right. But before we start getting into the deeper meanings of a lot of these things and getting into those things that we want to talk about, because we obviously have a lot to talk about, this is an anime episode, which means we are getting a Karen uh, summary. So Karen, can you tell us what happened in this movie? Okay. All right, you guys. Yes. Anime time, Karen summary time. Here we go. So it is time for Chibiusa to return to the future. But before she can leave, everyone gathers to watch the solar eclipse. At the event, a new enemy appears, the Dark Moon Circus. This troop sets up a fair in town and starts turning people's dreams into nightmares. Also, a pegasus named Helios appears and says he is searching for a maiden and a golden crystal to save his home, Elysion. Zirconia is the leader of the Dead Moon Circus, commanded by this season's eldritch horror queen, Nehellenia, who actually used to be part of the ancient Moon Kingdom. And their goal is simple, obtain the legendary silver crystal. Each of the Amazonas quartet has their encounter with the inner sailor guardians and preys upon their dreams. Usagi and Chibiusa are treated to a body swap as they each want what the other has. Meanwhile, Mamoru becomes incredibly sick with a curse and deals with complicated feelings he's holding Usagi back from achieving her true potential. By the end of part one, Usagi is also infected with the same curse. In part two, the outer guardians arrive on the scene. Setsuna, Haruka, and Michiru have been raising baby Hotaru, who grew up shockingly fast, and the four of them are all sailor guardians in their own right now. And even though they try to help, everyone ends up trapped. Um, in Elysion, Helios explains to Mamoru and Usagi that Elysion used to be Mamoru's kingdom on Earth, and it was powered by a golden crystal. Usagi realizes that just like the legendary silver crystal was inside of her, the golden crystal must be inside of Mamoru. Helios uses the last of his power to save the day. The golden crystal is awakened and the curse is lifted. And after a true love's kiss between Mamoru and Usagi, everyone gets princess powers and they defeat the dark moon circus. This saves Helios who returns um, the Amazonas Quartet back to their true identities as sailor guardians of the four asteroids. And we find out these four will reawaken later when Chibi Moon needs them as her inner guardians. The end. Oh man, that is so much to put into a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, welcome in, Garnet. Welcome in. Yes, the dream arc is really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of people's favorite arc for a lot of um, of reasons that we are going to go into. I think I think it's an excellent arc in pretty much every version of uh, of Sailor Moon, and it's a pretty good one in Crystal too. Yes, absolutely. So, yep. I guess the thing that we should start with is that they had a successful season one, an incredibly successful season two, a great and well written season three that is our favorite. And then they made a movie. So uh, why a why a movie? Why it's so why? it's kind of strange. It's kind of strange. It's, it's very it's very uh, relatable in terms of like Sailor Moon movies were incredibly popular. There were three main ones. There were also a lot that like that were shortened down and put onto Cartoon Network. But these were the three big ones. Mm -hmm. But the I. Like, why? Because, like, yep. these ones stand on their own and aren't necessarily a season or move the story forward. They're just kind of an extra, they're an extra information sort of bit. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So um, so these are the, the three Sailor Moon movies and then there's Eternal. So I showed, told you guys at the top of the stream, tell us what your favorite uh, Sailor Moon movie was and I'll send you um, a pack of stickers. These are some example stickers that we had made. They we will um, put some packs up on sale uh, before we get to Christmas. But um, I'm going to give away the mock-ups. So let us know your favorite Sailor Moon movie. We'll do a little random drawing at the end for everybody that told us. So it was revealed to be a movie in 2017, and it was supposed to come out in 2020. So the plan was like, okay, 
Sailor Moon Crystal's got some momentum now. We're, we're going to do the money thing and we're going to make a movie so that we can release it in theaters in Japan. It was supposed to come out in 2020. Now, I got pushed back to 2021 due to COVID. Um, but I do know that I have seen some discourse in the fandom that like COVID is part of the reason it was a movie or something like that. That's not really true. It was it was always planned to be a movie. And it's literally just because they wanted to release it in theaters and make that theater money. Uh, which is so sad. <laughs> yeah, we, it really is. Like, I want to be honest, straight up, we thought it was because of COVID. We, for a very long time, were under the impression that this was a setback release because of COVID, and this was the easiest way to get it out, and the easiest way to keep everyone safe who was working on it, uh, and it turns out that that, that was a lie. That was a lie mm-hmm. we told ourselves, mm-hmm. and the truth is so much more depressing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep. Um, so it was literally just to release it in theaters. Uh, that's that's why they did it. It's very similar to what happens to a lot of series in the U.S. that they turn into movie franchises where they're like, oh, it's time to do the final book. Um, uh, mm, let's split it in two. OK. And we talked about this quite a lot when we talked about the Matrix sequels. You can go find that episode on my YouTube channel. And, uh, and how kind of detrimental this is and, um, and how ultimately this is maybe not the best way to do the dream arc. Like, I mean, I want to acknowledge what you said, Garnet. Yes. In the manga, the dream arc and the stars arcs are shorter, um, page wise, but I don't necessarily think they're shorter content wise. And I think, yeah. And I think that, um, just because something's shorter page wise, uh, pages don't, come on to this it doesn't like to, so totally translate over to the screen there were still things that had to be cut out with the first three seasons there were things that had to be moved around even if it was true to the manga it 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 it, it was a true representation but it was still a representation which means that they could have taken that and done the same thing because instead of having what we had 12 episodes six hours of content we had three hours of content for the season that's half that's half and that's a ridiculous amount of cutting. Yeah. Yep. And um, and something something that happens. Well, let's uh, let's do this. Okay, we're gonna talk about why this is crappy, and then we're gonna talk about why Sailor Moon Eternal is actually good. So the first reason that the movie kind of fails is because. You know, traditionally, you would have like the Amy episode, and then you'd have like the Ray episode, and then you'd have the Makoto episode. Because these are all kind of like these now 10 minute segments where you don't breathe at all in between, it, it feels like we got less development for the girls, which isn't really true because like Amy's segment has more development for her yeah. than any of her segments in previous seasons. And yet it's like, boom, done. And you're like, oh, it's time. It's Ray's time now. And it's like, there's no digestion time. There's no time to breathe in between. So it feels like no one cares about the inner senshi in Eternal. Well, like, let's call it what it is. This isn't written as a movie. This isn't written as a movie. A movie has a plot structure that follows the entirety of a plot sh- of a plot outline where if you have an ensemble cast, everyone kind of gets their moments, but they're all integrated with one another, which is incredibly different to what the TV shows has. Because the TV show, you can have a 30 minute episode or a 20 minute episode dedicated to each scout and it not feel like you're missing anything. You're not missing that integration because you're having it in 30 minute like intervals. Mm -hmm. When you have it in a full movie and all of a sudden you're like, okay, we're just going to focus on Mina and we're never going to go back to her after this. We're just going to do this. Or we're just going to focus on this character and never go back to it. There's no harmony. It's not, it's not written like a movie. It's written like a TV show that was then produced as a movie. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was. And and like, I don't want to like trash anybody that worked on the movie because there's a lot of good in this movie as well. And we'll talk um, about and that. I, yeah, and, and I know that Naoko Takuchi was like very heavily involved in the production of Sailor Moon Eternal. Um, but uh, but yeah, the, the writing is, is not movie writing. It is not adapted to its medium appropriately. It is literally just like they wrote each episode and then smooshed them together. Um, 
<laughs> That's what they did. That's what they yeah. did. And the first part especially suffers for this because the manga and anime both are incredibly episodic in the beginning as you're introducing each villain and giving each of the girls their little character development moment. And this can be like the translation that they're trying to release. They're trying to translate it from the manga and still be faithful in the ways that the other three seasons have been because that's a way to retain fans. Uh, but because of that, it, it throws off the structure. Instead of having a three act structure like most people are used to seeing in movies, we are getting a, pl- a full plot in 10 to 15 minute increments. We're getting- and there's a reason. And there's a reason that this particular medium lends itself to a three act structure, Mm -hmm. right? The amount of time that you have to cover, it basically fits that. So when you don't do that, it feels like, oh, oh, wait, the movie's over now. Oh, it's time to go to part two. Like, it almost feels like, what? (laughs) It's like, it's like the roller coaster. Instead of like going up all the way to the high point and then going down and enjoying the roller coaster ride, you're like taking like little mini and then down and then mini and then down and then mini ups mm-hmm. and then down like it's a very mm-hmm. like what is happening here <laughs> you can't, there's never a point in time you can flow with it because you're experiencing these emotional climactic moments every 10 minutes yeah. uh and that's just not how we uh as people who are who are like watch movies who enjoy media that's not the traditional way that we are used to media being presented to us uh, having a plot like diagram with exposition, a conflict, rising action. This is all stuff I'm teaching in sixth grade right now. Uh, rising action, a climax with res- resolving resolution and all that. That is a normal way to tell a story that most, most elements of media take after. Mm-hmm. And when you have something that is so contradictory to that, but also still copies that because in each 10 minute section, you still have all of those steps. <laughs> It's incredibly overwhelming and unsatisfying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying, uh, Sailor Garner. Uh, Amy is like an amazing character. And, and I think that she gets her she gets her time to shine in this. But because it's you move on so fast, you don't get a chance to digest it. I think that's really a shame. Um, and, but it happens to all of the girls. All of the girls, this this is kind of like what what their situation is in this particular movie. And, and there's a reason that most manga gets adapted into anime as opposed to getting to uh, getting adapted into movies, right? Um, because the structures are similar. Like the structure you use to make a, a chapter of, of manga is a very similar structure that you're going to use to make an episode of anime. So it really fits and you don't have to change too much to make it work in the new medium. Well, and also, and it's not just like character focus, it's also certain plot for- forms focus. I know I talked to you about this, but when yeah. we have Mamoru and, and Usagi go to Elysion, it is supposed to be this big, huge moment where all of a sudden they've passed out, they've turned into little kids, like they are stuck in their dreams, uh, the scouts are worried, and they are in Elysion learning about things. And that's a moment that can be emotional, that can be incredibly important. It lasts not even 10 minutes in the film. And all of that emotion that we're set up for fades in five minutes. And then we have to be emotional about the next thing. It doesn't give us any time to process what has happened. And because of that, we don't connect to the story that's being told. Yeah. And I know that something that we struggled with um, in, in, uh, in this is like, how do we even figure out what the themes are when you know, us watching it, there was like no chance to breathe. So I know when it came to this, to this particular movie compared to the uh, other three seasons, we almost had to be like, wait, what are the themes of the dream arc again? Hang on, let's revisit. Let's talk about what happened in there. Cause it didn't naturally, um, and this happened to both of us. It didn't naturally yeah. come to us after watching it. And, you know, and we've been doing this before we started the, the Twitch channel, right? Analyzing media in this way. So it's not That's- like we're not practiced at this. Okay. Like we know what we're doing. Um, it's usually pretty yeah. easy to be like, obviously, here's a theme, here's a theme, here's a theme. And when in Sailor Moon Eternal, I feel like we had the most difficult time deciding what themes to talk about compared to like and, every other piece of media. <laughs> and we found them, like we eventually found them by discussion but it it really was I think because also when looking at overarching themes of a tv show there is a lot of 
good ways to binging a tv show is not the best way to digest a tv show when in terms <laughs> of of trying to tear it apart mm-hmm. uh, because everything runs together and they're supposed to be episodic uh but when you have something that feels like it's written as a tv show that you ingest in one or two sittings as we did with this movie because it's a movie so instead of pausing every couple episodes to watch something else or to take a break you're watching it all through it's a lot harder to sit there and be like what was the overall point of all of these things that have many peaks and mountains and instead of climbing one big hill Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep yep and it so so the I wish it had been a season but it's not just that there's also something about the dream arc that I think exists in other interpretations of Sailor Moon as well. This is not unique to Crystal, but the dream arc, because it focuses so much on Chibusa, it's quite kid-friendly, okay, yes. compared to others. You know, no, I know it's super gay, but like, whatever, like, that's not what I mean. What I mean is also, like... Also, it could be, it could be, gay things could be kid-friendly too. Yes, <laughs> yes, they to totally can. They totally can. Yeah, I'm but glad I was able to experience of, Sailor Moon. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because of I the agree, retention, Garnet. because of the retention rate, as far as like, oh, you have a high emotional point every 10 minutes, every 10 to 15 minutes. That really speaks to a younger audience because their ability to like remain active with what they're consuming is a lot less than adults. Yep. So and we know is- this, like, I- I'm sure you used to do this as a kid too. Like if you had a favorite piece of media, you would watch it over and over and over again and not get tired of it. And it's, it's because as a kid, you're not fully digesting it in one sitting like you might as an adult (laughs) yeah well and also just like the attention rate of like having high emotional moments is a way to get someone invested in that makes time fast really quickly so if you have 10 high emotional moments in an hour and a half that's going to be like sucking a kid in a lot more than if you just had a standard uh plot arc yeah um And so that makes it feel very much like the audience, the purposeful audience was towards children, even though overall it has been a very even spread between adults and children for the rest of the season, the series. Yeah. I would say the other, the other seasons, the target audience is probably more like teens and tweens Mm -hmm. um, with the understanding that kids and adults can enjoy it too. Whereas I felt like this movie was like, target audience kids with the thought that teens and adults can enjoy it too um yeah, I def- instead <laughs> I, yeah I can definitely see like instead of being like hey we're going to target the 15 to 16 year olds we're going to target the 11 to 12 year olds yeah and that doesn't seem like a big huge jump in demographic but when you're an adult having something that is marketed towards tweens is very different than something that's marketed towards teens Mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. it's the same thing as we talked about the difference between children's literature and young adult literature like it's yeah. that that is a giant developmental jump and we're seeing that happen on the screen for a movie yeah yeah yep it's definitely how it felt watching it um and it's just and it's okay everything that we're talking about with why the movie failed is also part of what makes it kind of good because it's not just that like oh it's kid it's super kid friendly and that makes it kind of hard for us to engage with but also like it's super kid friendly and that was kind of nice too <laughs> this is at the end of the day sailor moon is supposed to be accessible for kids it's yeah. a cartoon manga like and i know that that's that's like a huge industry in japan but it 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 is still a kid's show. It is still a show that is teaching kids how to communicate, what healthy boundaries look like. Uh, it is supposed to get the 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 attention and retention of small kids. Yeah. And this does help it. And that's mm-hmm. awesome to see. It's also awesome to see as we shift from Usagi being our main character to Shibiusa being a very strong protagonist in this series as well. Yeah, and you guys know um, Landon is a Shibiusa stan. So of course, you know, uh, an arc that Chibusa is clearly the main character of is um, is is quite heartwarming. <laughs> really, no, and I, I think it's an interesting arc that she goes through because we've seen it's almost in reverse. Like Usagi, as she gets older, she's like taken on more responsibility. But Chibusa, she's just like, I have to be an adult. And then all of a sudden, she's like, I'm okay with being a kid, but I can't wait to be an adult. And now, after especially after the body switch, she's like, Man, I like I like being a kid. I got a friend. 
I got a future boyfriend. Life's good. <laughs> yep. Yep. She kind of like, she kind of uh, in the dream arc realizes that her goals don't have a time limit. Yes. It's like, okay, my goals can happen later. And, and that's not, I'm not only okay with that. I think that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good thing that there's more to come later. And not to like get a little bit like trauma, but like that that speaks to a level of like the kids that were forced to grow up can relate to that level of like, oh, all of a sudden you have a character on screen who was forced to grow up so fast and get to heal that and get to be a kid again and remains a kid throughout the rest of the season, series. And that's a really, mm-hmm. that's a really cool story to tell. I think it's because at the time I was watching is around the same age that she was. I think a lot of people were. Right. Like, I think a lot of people that were actually watching Sailor Moon were closer to Chibiusa's age than they were to Usagi's age. Yeah, I was. I definitely Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, So it's, I think it's pretty common with, like, older Zoomers and younger Millennials to have uh, Chibiusa as a favorite. (laughs) So I think that's probably the difference between, like, I'm like, I like Chibiusa, but she's not a favorite. Whereas Landon is like, Chibiusa all day, every day. And yeah. and I think that that's pretty typical of um of that particular age group compared to like when Sailor Moon was airing in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, youngerish millennial here. I think you're you're a youngerish millennial too, right, Landon? You're not all the way to Zoomer, I don't think, right? No, I'm I'm like in the last three years of a millennial, so I'm a very okay. Young that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's pretty common for people your age. I feel like most um mm-hmm. most Sailor Moon. Um, fans that are around your age are like really, really into chip use. Is 30s younger? I mean, I'm, I'm, it, depend, it depends on how. I'm 36. I would, I would say I'm pretty close to the middle. I'm like m- mid to older yeah. uh, millennial myself, and I'm 36. I think, I think millennials right now are spanning from like 42 to 25. Tends yeah. to be that age span where we're yeah. at right now. 32. Uh, yeah, you're middle, middle to younger side. I would say at 32. Yeah. yeah, and I'm 28, so I'm on the younger side. Yep. So I think that's that's pretty that's pretty normal. And uh, and and seeing a particularly good uh, portrayal of Chibusa and Helios's relationship at this movie, I think, really, really speaks to that. So um, so it's all it's also good that it focuses on Chibusa and is a little bit more kid friendly. It's also because of its kid friendliness. Easy to watch. Mm-hmm. Hard to try to figure out how to talk about it for two hours because it's three hours worth of content with you know, up and down emotional things uh, and trying to pick themes out, but very easy to watch. Yeah. It's so comfy cozy. So comfy cozy. Like if you're going to, if you just want to put on some Sailor Moon for the background and curl up with like a cup of um, of hot chocolate, like this is, this is the one. Um, Go to, go to the next picture. I want everybody to see what I picked out for comfy cozy. Yeah, there we go. So cute. Oh my gosh. And I love this scene. I I love this scene in every version. I just think it's so, it's so cute. The family in bed. (laughs) I do. I also appreciate that we've gotten it throughout all the seasons. Like we've Mm -hmm. gotten this scene of like, of the three of them hanging out. And in the first, in the, in the second season with Chibiusa, it was like, Usagi obviously she looks angry in this one but like was like hating it and then well because yeah because it, 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 they're talking about they're because they're about to do the body swap next and this is the one where they're about to do the body swap in the next scene and Mamoru yeah. is like you know Chibi Yusa, you're a lot you're a lot more mature than Usagi was when she was your age <laughs> and Usagi's like shut up <laughs> shut up <laughs> um, hey like, welcome in a, Alpha Tiff <laughs> it was a lot of antagonistic sort of things in the second season in the third season, it was very much like protective. And in this one, it just feels like a family. It's very cute. Yeah, like they kind of, they're comfortable with each other. Like they're being their true selves around each other. You know, that's very, very nice. Yeah, um, I crush on older cousin. I uh, had a crush on an older cousin that was very much like Helios. That's too funny, Garnet. <laughs> Helios is too cool though, right? Like he's too cool for school. He's like, like the chillest. He's um, like, <laughs> yeah, he's like a kinder version of Mamoru. Like Mamoru always was like, especially when the beginning with Usagi and Mamoru, he yeah, was like yeah, the yeah. he was like the like standoffish one. And I'm like, this is the this is the kite prince. This is the yeah. Ma- Mamoru is not afraid to tease as a yes. form of affection. Helios would never. No, Helios he, would never do he that. He is the golden retriever boyfriend. Like he just <laughs> is like yes. My goal mm-hmm. is to make you happy, and I will mm-hmm. do everything I can for that to happen. <laughs> yep, and in and in every moment too, in every single moment. <laughs> yeah. So all yeah, the time. this this movie is uh, compared to the rest of Sailor Moon Crystal. It is the easiest to 
watch. You can definitely just like waste the day away putting on part one and two of this and you can feel like relaxed very, very easily Um, because and I think it's it's partly uh, because the structure is kind of jacked up. (laughs) Well, it's like it's also like a ADHD friend here. Uh, Sometimes I'm not the best at paying attention to movies all the time. So it's Mm. like really easy to like go in and then come back and then like go out and then come back in and like still kind of be aware of the plot that is happening and really being able to get access to that, like that short, quick, like things that are, I'm like, oh, I'm all caught up. Life's good. Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. the last episode, because the last 10 minutes had very little to do with the next 10 minutes, life's good. It's okay if I missed it. That's true. That's true. If you fall asleep during a few minutes of this movie, you're, you didn't miss nothing. You'll be you fine. <laughs> uh, and that's when I first watched this because I had watched this a couple, like a year ago when it first came out. Uh, I, it was fine. I was like, cool, this is awesome. I can I can also like skip ahead if I need to or whatever. Not really missing anything. Um, and I didn't even realize that that's what I had done and had felt comfort- comfortable doing that until I was like, had to sit through this whole one for this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yep. And then you were like, oh, wait a second. (laughs) Oh, many ups and downs. (laughs) Yes. Yes. It's quite a lot. If you really are trying to pay attention for like an analysis point of view to try to understand like what the dream arc is really about. This is this is probably um, out of all of the versions of Sailor Moon. This one is the hardest to digest version of the dream arc. I'd also say easiest to watch, hardest to tear apart. Like yeah. as far as like figuring out the whole points of it. Yep. And there's one and other then, thing that is super, super awesome. Super awesome in the dream arc. And Crystal does a fantastic job with it. Uh, Landon, what is it? Them villains, though. <laughs> we are we are so we are good. villain whores here. We do mm. love a good written villain. And mm. man, fish mm. eye and tiger's eye, they like imprinted in the back of my head somewhere and I was like oh these guys I totally <laughs> forgot about these guys <laughs> uh, gender goals right honestly gender goals <laughs> I, I love it I love how just truly gender fluid we're coming with these villains uh oh, because the <laughs> the you know the the queer the secretly queer villains are always like a trope that exists in a lot mm-hmm. of cartoons and media and I'm like man this is not making it a secret they embrace it and it's yeah. great <laughs> and it's so it's so funny um because in the 90s anime when they dubbed it over uh these three characters are so so queer that yeah. you can't even hide it in yeah. with clever editing and uh and and changes. Like they can't just be like they're cousins. Um, you know, it was it was very obvious make, even in the 90s. Did they make anime. one of them a woman? Yeah, Fish Eyes a lady. Yeah, Fish, Fish Eyes a lady. lady. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. No. Yep. But you know what? You know what basically Sailor Moon is saying with these three guys? They're saying, guess what? Animals in their natural state, they don't have gender. They just do what they want. And that really speaks to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's re- that speaks to me. Animals turned into humans. They're like, what is gender? I've never met her. Um, I'm just going to do what I want and be what I want. And that is to be the queerest possible version of myself. Yes. <laughs> truly. <laughs> truly gold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they could have done um, it till they're blue in the face. I knew fish. I was queer, but I didn't have the language. Exactly. Like it was exactly. impossible. Like if you didn't pick up on, on, um, Uranus and Neptune being a couple, if you didn't realize that was queer, you realized this was queer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then it only gets queer from here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, but we love them. We love the animals. And then you have the Amazonist Quartet, um, mm-hmm. which I just love predicted Gen Z's lack of wanting to wear clothing mm-hmm. uh, prior to Gen Z even being born. Uh, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. I'm just like looking at these and I'm like, man, these are the Sailor Scout uniforms of the future. This makes sense in this reality. I see it happening. <laughs> it's almost as if um, Nako Takauchi like Googled um, Sa- Sailor Moon uh, porn version and was like, yeah. mm, stealing that. I'm stealing that. I'm stealing that. Um, and then, like, I lie a little bit. Embrace- I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I lie a little bit. I know that now Kotakuchi actually knew a lot about fashion and that's why the, the outfits are the way they are in Sailor Moon. I know. I'm just making a joke, a little jokey joke. But uh, 
But yeah, I mean, they're great. Like, look at them. They look so free. They look so free and and of themselves and uh, loving their bodies. And they Mm -hmm. do look like how Gen Z would, like, I, Sailor Moon, perfectly millennial. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The Amazonist, just being the, the, like, generation below, makes perfect sense to me. I get absolutely. it. <laughs> absolutely. Even though Gen Z didn't exist at the time. <laughs> it makes, I'm like, man, this is what it would be. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Chibi Usa <laughs> would be a Gen Zer, mm-hmm. and this is what they would look like when they eventually yep. awoke to help her protect the world. Yeah, Miss Takoshi predicting the future out here. Um, but what, what makes the Amazonist Quartet so cool and so interesting is also that they have an actual connection to the backstory. They don't want to help get the legendary silver crystal just to get power, okay? They have been mind-controlled by Queen Nehalenia, um, and she chose them strategically because she knew that eventually they were going to awaken as sailor scouts whenever Chibiusa um, you know, grew enough as Sailor Chibi Moon to need them. So that shows she knew that she had to go get them early before they actually awakened to Sailor Scouts and like train them up and uh, to get the legendary silver crystal from them. So like she she knew because she was part of the Moon Kingdom, this potential future for them and exactly how to prey on them. So they have a deep connection to the the Sailor um scouts in a way that uh, the villains of previous seasons didn't always um especially last season season three's villains as you know we were not too pleased we're not too pleased <laughs> they came they came back swinging though they were like man yes. we gotta we gotta make this better no i do appreciate the uh thought that went into it especially because i know a critique we had with last season was just that there wasn't it wasn't necessary for them to have as many villains as they had last time yeah and even though they have as many villains this time they made them necessary mm-hmm. and that's the important like it's like that intention with writing of like it makes sense that there are these two different groups it 100% makes sense and i like it <laughs> yeah and queen Helena is just so cool like there's the there's the whole like light and darkness thing going on with her where um the basically what's implied in the backstory is that queen nehelenia and queen serenity were both royalty on the moon kingdom and um and queen nehelenia calls serenity out and says hey you weren't born here you conquered this place and so you can't represent the light the way you claim to you are problematic just like me. The difference is I'm here to embrace it. And you can't exist without me because you never could have conquered this place without a little bit of darkness in you. And Serenity says, a la 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 la, and then banishes her, right? So Queen Nehalenia is back. Um, and, and the way that she is defeated is by Serenity, I mean, not Serenity, um, Usagi basically saying, you know, you're right. But that doesn't give you the right to uh, to I- push your darkness upon everybody. I'm going to do better. Um, and uh, and, you know, Nehalini has got a point. Nehalini has yes. got a point. That's He's not wrong. wrong. I think I think there's something really cool about the Eldritch Horrors or the main villain being a woman and how that does change things. Because I'm like thinking back to Queen Beryl and I'm just like man like having that connection I think makes it a lot I like those ones better I mean I think that like the idea of like hey connected with Queen Beryl with being jealous of um Usagi and then Queen Nehalenia having that beef with uh with Queen Serenity it really makes it feel more connected than the other two villains did in season two and three um and feel more personal and there is like that, because that's the thing is that it should be personal. <laughs> it should be. You should know why the villain cares, right? It shouldn't just be, I want the legendary silver crystal because I want power. Yes. It should be, I want the legendary silver crystal um, because I have a connection to it. That is much stronger uh, sort of, of storytelling. Yeah. Well, and, 
I like the idea if one of them had been just about power uh, and like, like, hey, like if Dr. Tomo had been all about power and then hadn't been someone pulling the strings behind everything, right? Like- yeah. We think that- we talked about that before, like probably yes. what would have helped is to remove, um, what's what's her name? I already forgot her name. The woman that's this his assistant uh, that becomes Mistress Nine. Nine Mistress Nine. Uh, Mistress Nine. Nine. Thank you. Yeah, it, we probably would have been better if they had removed Mistress Nine and just yep. had Doctor Tomoe uh, interacting with um, with the the Eldritch Horror instead of having like Tomoe to Mistress Nine to the Eldritch Horror. Right, yep. Master Pharaoh Ninety was the Eldritch Horror there. You know, removing a step would have made a, a lot more sense. Um, yeah, yeah, the fairy tales in this arc, it also does make it feel kid-friendly. I totally agree with that, Garnet. Mm-hmm. The fact that we've got Nehalenia, the the her excuse for starting the beef, like she uses as she was gonna do this anyway, y'all. Don't be don't be fooled. But her, her excuse to start the beef with Serenity is you didn't invite me to the prin- the princess's baptism or whatever it was. It's not a baptism, it's something else, but whatever. You know, it looked like a baptism to me. Um, and I'm from the South, so that's what I saw. Her, <laughs> that's not what blessing. they call it. <laughs> her blessing, whatever it was. Anyway, they were baptizing the baby, obviously. Um, and yeah, and Nehalenia was not invited. So she was like, here's my chance. Time to, time to do the beef. Um, she was going to do it anyway, but, but I yeah, also, uh, and I know very, the, fairy tale. I also know the villains have always kind of been these colorful, like bright, charismatic sort of characters, like the Am- Amazonists and the, uh, animals. I think, however, it's this season, especially coming off of season three, where we didn't have as much connection with that feels very different. And feels also kid friendly in that way, where it's like, yeah. oh, you have these bright, colorful, obviously queer but flamboyant characters. Uh, that's easy to digest as a kid. You're like, yes, fun. I I like that. This is fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the villains with, are very fun. With the doctor last year, the, or last year, last season, that was uh, a lot less fun and a lot more like you had. He was very serious. <laughs> Mistress Nine. Mistress Nine was incredibly serious too, and the mm-hmm. huntresses. Well, and because the the themes of that particular season are so serious, where it's really about like yeah. the body and and the way that we relate to our our womanhood and and to our struggles through our body, like this is a very that's a very serious topic. Mm-hmm. Um, but this this is more about like your dreams and your goals. And uh, and I don't know how this is in Japan, but in in the U.S., you're asked like, what do you want to be when you grow up? From the time you're like in the first grade, so like kids are thinking about like, what are my goals in life? I what do I want to do with my life? You know, what's what's the thing that I that I want to eventually have spent time on this earth being? You know, and w- w- kids are thinking about that from a very very young age. So so yes, uh, it makes it it makes it very very um much more kid friendly. You yes. know. Yeah, deal with their victims' dreams. It makes sense that their whole thing delves into fantasy. Absolutely, Garnet. Absolutely, it's all interconnected, right? It's all interconnected, and uh, and and these villains are so good. So just like to kind of like sum it up, why they're so good. They have a real backstory, okay? And that's what we were missing from season uh, three's villains. Yes, and what we should have gotten more of also in some of seasons two's villains. Uh, they have a backstory like they did in season one, okay? That's what makes them awesome. We love it. Love it. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Shall we move on? Yes. But before before we do, just really quickly, I want to remind everybody, um, I've got I've got stickers and we're going to give these away. These are mock-ups um, that are eventually going to be you know part of a store that I'm going to make. But the mock-ups were given away. If you would like to uh, be entered into that, we're going to give one away this stream. Uh, all you need to do is tell us what your favorite Sailor Moon movie is. Tell us by the end of the stream, and um, and I'll kind of run that, if I could spell, stickers. There we go. Um, we'll run that at the end of the stream and uh, and pick a winner. I love yeah. circuses, but like Cirque du Soleil that are more acrobatic. Oh, what about a Cirque du Soleil of Sailor Moon? The- oh, imagine. It would be so good. It would be so imagine. good. Imagine. Oh. Someone talk to Cirque du Soleil. They need to get on that. Collab, collab. Okay, Sailor Moon and Cirque du Soleil collab. <laughs> it's there. It's written there already. Oh, it would be so good. All Dead right. Moon Circus. Yeah, 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 exactly. Let us move on to our themes. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. Uh, as you know here, Enter Stage Window is a big lover of audi- Audible, and you can try Audible for a month, uh, free for a month and get a audiobook at audibletrial.com slash Enter Stage Window. Uh, and I would like to take the opportunity 
to promote a graphic novel uh, that is available on Audible. And it's a very famous one. A TV series just came out about it. But that would be Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Uh, a little bit about dreams, a little bit about death, a little bit about the cool waking world and and uh, a lot of like similar themes kind of. So I figured that would be a good suggestion for today. Yeah, I mean, if you want to watch the dream arc, but like a more adult version, yes. Sandman is quite good for that, I would it say. Is. Yeah, it's very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good story. The TV show is good too, uh, but the graphic novel, the graphic novel and the novel are much better. <laughs> yeah, I haven't watched the TV show yet. Well, that's not true. I watched like three episodes, and um, and I don't know. I have such fond memories of the graphic novel that I'm just kind of like. I don't know. I, I had, I, I'm struggling to be invested in the TV show. Um, not that I have any complaints about it. It's just like, there's other things to watch. And I just haven't circled back. You know what I mean? But yeah, um, um, the graphic novel is excellent. Excellent. Yes. And I believe Neil Gaiman does help uh, narrate his audio, this audiobook, And he's a great narrator. He really um, He, I really love Neil Gaiman, especially when he narrates his own stuff. So he is one of the actors and the audiobook multi-talented yes but the uh, the original sandman graphic novel absolutely um makes my uh my inner warp tour uh hot topic goth heart happy. it is very it is very goth <laughs> but i feel like the pipeline to sailor moon to sandman is actually just a really real pipeline uh because yeah. there, it, there are uh, a lot of crossovers and they're both very <laughs> queer so very queer. Mm. incredibly queer Mm -hmm. um <laughs> incredibly focused on cool characters yes and uh the interaction of like duty and responsibility and the idea of like end of world stakes yes i love it ah oh, so good so good so yeah mm -hmm. um sign up for audible you can get a month free and you help out the show when you do that uh, even if you only sign up for the free month and cancel after that, because there there is no obligation to keep it after that, uh, you still help out the show, even if you do not keep it. So if you don't have Audible, you should totally get Audible. Yes. Um, I'm a big fan because I would not have a chance to read if it weren't for audiobooks. <laughs> just too busy. Just too busy. Too everything busy. that everything that we say, like, oh, we've read it. I'm a liar. I have listened to it. No, I haven't read reading. something in it's years. Very, it's very important. <laughs> To say that that is reading. It's true. It you is reading. You can listen to something and engage in a book and that's still reading. <laughs> it's true. It is still reading. We believe that. I, so, yes. I, I actually physically read more than yeah, I do. I, I, Mostly because my brain doesn't like to take the time to listen. <laughs> 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 All yeah. right. Shall we move on? Books on tape as a kid. Yes. Audible. Books on <sighs> tape. Exactly. On tape. Same thing. Great for road oh. trips. Yes, yes. All right, so let's actually get into the themes. Let's actually get into the themes. So there's a lot of relationship stuff going on in the dream arc, and it's mostly around inadequacy, feelings of inadequacy in relationships. And there's three in particular that we want to highlight. And first is Chibiusa and Helios. And, and Landon, tell us your thoughts about relationship inadequacy in relation to Chibiusa and, and Helios as a, as a Chibiusa and Helios stan. Um, well, Helios obviously has this thing for this lady who has, you know, given him information. And so he's, he's holding feelings for this idea of someone. And Chibiusa meets this beautiful boy and is just like, man, I'm not good enough for him <laughs> and has a big old crush on him anyway. Uh, and, and I think this is the first time that we really see her have first of all a crush on a boy we'll talk about a relationship that she has had like possibly romantic for feelings for previously but this particular relationship is like definitely heavy-handed romance and definitely like means something to her and she doesn't really know how to interact with it and she feels very inadequate on how to handle it uh and I think that that's something really cool because that that shows us a reflection of a relationship that we've seen previously in this series uh, that's very reflective of Usagi and Momoru from season one, uh, where Usagi felt very inadequate around Momoru. Um, 
and had those same flustery first love sort of feelings. And so it's really cool to see that played out four seasons, for lack of a better word, or three seasons in a movie later, uh, to see that being played out again with their kid. And it's really cute. It's so cute. And she does feel like really scared and mm-hmm. um, and inadequate in relation to Helios. But you can totally tell that these are kind of like her her first really intense romantic feelings, because regardless of her own feelings of inadequacy, you can tell they come from a place of like, I really want to lift this boy up and help him. I mean, he's asking for help and you can see this like deep like inner desire for Chibiusa to be the one that helps him through his challenges. And, um, and if that's not the core of romance, then like what is? <laughs> so <laughs> and then you also, I mean, again, just to, cause there's a reason why I wanted to call this relationship cycle. And that's because you also see like at the same time, Helio's having these deep emotional feelings for someone he thinks might exist. Right. He has a vision of a lady who gives him information with pink hair. She's older. Um, <laughs> it's all, it's, it's the same obviously. silhouette as Dark Lady. It's, it's obviously it's old Chibiusa. It's fine. <laughs> but you know what? Who did that too? His fucking prince did that too. Momoru had this like image of Queen Serenity or Princess Serenity that he mm-hmm. just like was like, man, this woman's going to change my life and have all the mm-hmm. answers. Same silhouette and same hairstyle as this tiny little child that's fallen after me, but no way, they can't be related at all. Yep. And then, oh, it's future Usagi. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> same person. Mm-hmm. Um, no, and it, it is, it is like, and that's really fun to have written that like first love sort of thing. And because it happened so long ago, and Usagi was young but she's not as young as Chibiusa. This really like connects to like the feeling that I think is kind of universal when we all have that first like crush, that Mm -hmm. first person that we really, really like and are just like, I don't know if he likes me back and I really care about him. So I want to continue to do everything we can in order to support Mm -hmm. him. But also I really like him and I wish he would notice me and why am I not good enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say that like, it's this is probably the most realistic like first crush that I can think of off the top of my head. And the reason why it is, is because it happens to Chibiusa so young. And maybe this just speaks to me as as an incredibly romantic and sexual person. I am nowhere on the ace spectrum at all. Um, and, uh, and I had my first crush when I was in kindergarten. Okay. I was wanting to kiss boys when I was five years old. Old. So seeing Chibusa in elementary school or go through this, I'm like, mm, relate. <laughs> yeah, your girl was engaged in the first grade. Like I get it. <laughs> you you were engaged. You had like a you had like a husband. <laughs> Someone asked me to marry them. It was very cute. Oh, and you're um, like, of course, <laughs> duh. <laughs> of course, yes, I'll marry you. Um, but yeah, no, it is. It is a fun. It's a young, innocent feeling. And again, this is a character that has been through so much. And I know I'm, my Chibiusa stan is coming out in me, but this is a character that's been through so much. So to see her be able to regress in that way and be safe in this like relationship is really cute. And I love it a lot. Yes, it's so cute. So cute. <laughs> so cute. I just, I just think, I, I, and I just think it's like, so it's so pure and wholesome. Like I, I love that for both Usagi and Chibiusa, the boys that they get crushes on are actually like decent people. It's kind of nice. Yes. It's very fluffy, but there it's kind of nice. Yeah. There isn't any like not decent love, like people other than, I think there was like an ex-boyfriend for one of the scouts that was like, no, no bueno. But other than that. Yeah. in in the nineties anime, there's some stuff in the filler episodes. That's kind of like that, but nothing in the main the most, plot. Nothing, yeah. Nothing in this main plot. All the boys are just support their girlfriends which is what Such we need in media <laughs> what's the what's the opposite of dark romance like i also enjoy myself some light romance it feels wrong fluffy, to call it light romance yeah fluffy fluff, love, fluff, fluff romance fluff. yeah i mean i i also enjoy a good um low stakes coffee shop au from time to yes. time <laughs> I, that's the best way to explain it actually yes everyone mm-hmm. everyone would be in a coffee shop au without it being a coffee shop <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah 
this is the romance you uh refer to your coworkers to like that they're like hey you need you need romance situation you need romance recommendations let me tell you these ones the dark fucked up ones can't talk to you about but this no, like light um, shit this is fine that's where you that's what you give you give your discord friends those yes that's what you give your discord <laughs> friends please please give us recommendations thank you so much uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes so um so yeah Chibius and Helios super wholesome um nice little cycle repeat of uh of Usagi and Mamoru from season one um but uh but instead it's uh it's Chibius and Helios and, and again them. a very reflection of like just the stage in a relationship that is new and exciting and like where you have crushes on each other because he also develops a crush on her too a little bit too and it's very cute and sweet so that's an important part of this cycle. And then we move on. Oop. Oh, I love that Chibi moment too, that... Garnet. <clears throat> which which mo- moment? Oh, the there's a, a he- Chibiusa and Helios moment when Helios tells Chibiusa that there's some things that he can't talk about. And Chibiusa um, gets mad at him. And yes. um, until she tells off Usagi saying the same thing. And then she realizes she needs to actually just like understand that secrets are okay sometimes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so then we have Chibiusa and Hotaru. So Ooh, incredibly queer. I was just gonna say incredibly queer coded relationship here too. Um, oh yeah, they, there's they lots going on there. Friends, or if they have crushes on each other, or if they're just soulmates. I mean, I think soulmates. it's kind of like I think it's kind of like queer in the same way that like Usagi is constantly getting crushes on her friends. Yes. I think this is like Chibiusa's version of that. But in in the narrative structure, they are mirrors of each other, right? So yeah. Hotaru ages very quickly. Um, in Eternal, once the uh, the eclipse happens, all of a sudden, Hotaru goes from a baby to a child within the span of a few months, right? That's that's essentially that that's the scene that you get with all of the um, outer guardians and like her growing up or whatever. It happens very, very quickly. Whereas Chibusa ages very, very slowly. She gets stuck as a child due to uh, the trauma that she goes through. So um, Hotaru and Chibusa are um our best friends in that way and i think in sailor moon in just in general it's very common to like even though you have your romantic relationship like you have usagi and mamaru you have your best friends that are in it for the long haul yes. in the same way even if there's not explicit romance so you've got usagi with all of the inner guardians and with chibusa you've got chibusa and hotaru they are clearly like in it for the long haul it doesn't matter if there is romance or not yeah it's that soul it's that soulmate sort of like you matter to me sort of love like and and I love that there is a line where Hitaru is like I grew up so quickly for you so Mm -hmm. we can be Mm -hmm. the same age so mm-hmm. we can do this together and like that is a moment for Chibiusa who's feeling very like affected by the fact of her age and it is a touchy subject and she has a lot of trauma about it to like hear someone sit there and do something for her and and put her first and that's like a it's a moment for yeah. her yeah. like to hear that someone's in her corner and it's mm-hmm. not like a mentor figure like I think at this no. in the, by this season she knows that Usagi and Mamoru are in her corner but that's different that's different. Yeah. Well, and especially because they, well, because last season too, she had a, she had a, the same friendship and bond with Hutaru. And Hutaru, like, obviously cared very deeply about her because she, like, broke free of the mind control that was taking over her and then ended up having to, like, step into the Sailor Saturn role and sacrifice herself. And then she came back. And so, like, Chibi Usa lost the friend, the only friend she had. And she lost it to someone being able to be reborn, but not knowing if she'd ever really know her again. Uh, and knowing that like this friend died and just because she's coming back doesn't mean it's going to be the same. Yeah. And poor Chibi, um, so she's had to have this, she's had this happen to her so many times. Like we meet her, her like best friend early on is, is Setsuna, mm-hmm. right? It's Sailor Pluto, even though this, she, they're not really peers. Like uh, Sailor Pluto is obviously much older and more experienced than she is. Um, but still, and like, um, and like, so the, and she has like little school friends, right? But none of those friends that she's given at school um, are also Sailor Guardians and can also understand that side of her life. So the relationship between um, Chibiusa and Hotaru is incredibly important because 
uh, Hotaru is the only person that can relate to all aspects of Chibiusa's life. She can relate to the fact that they are the same um, age, maturity-wise. She can relate to the fact that they're both Sailor Guardians. She can relate to the fact that they have both had supernatural struggles with their aging and maturity process. And she gives someone for Chibiusa to look up to to say like, oh, this person is my same age and she can do all of these things. So I know I can do all of these things too. Not like in a the way that she relates to Usagi, where it's like, someday I will have these long, beautiful legs and be this strong sailor guardian. Where it's yeah. like, no, today, today I will be that. Because Hotaru is. I feel like them being foils of each other and where this relationship is in its like cycle uh, for each other is of like that area of growth. Yeah. You both are growing together. You're developing that thing. It's no longer like a oh my gosh, I like this, I like this person and I really want to be their friend and I really want to have a relationship. Like you're, you're bettering each other for the better and you're like actually getting to know each other and settling down in that stage. Yeah, And that's an incredibly important relationship cycle. And we've seen that again, we've seen that with uh, Usagi and the other scouts. We also saw it in Usagi and Mamoru's relationship too, mm. where they pushed each other to be better versions of themselves. Yes. Uh, especially where Mamoru pushed Usagi in the second season to be a better version of herself too. Mm-hmm. And that's Absolutely. like a really important like part of a positive relationship. Mm-hmm. And that's what's being shown on screen. Yes. And we get to have that like, we get to have that in all aspects, like exactly what Garnet is saying in the chat. Like we get to have it in romantic relationships um, that are, you know, younger and purely romantic. We get to have it in older um, relationships that are obviously like more mature like that, like what we've got with um, the the king and the queen, um, as well as Usagi and Mamoru. And we get to have it with just platonic friendships as well. So like it, it doesn't matter whether romance is is a part of that relationship or not. You can still make sure that you are taking care of the other person and doing right by them. And it's still foundational. I think that yeah. that's also something that makes this show so incredibly queer too, is because so much of, so much of straight media hierarchies of romance relationships to uh, like to friendships. That is mm-hmm. unfortunately just how our world is built. Our society makes that hierarchy possible. Yeah, like um, the nuclear family and da 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 all contributes to also, that. It, but, it, but, 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 but. it has to do with like, you know, it has to do with a lot of things. Uh, not yeah. to be on a soapbox. But <laughs> that is something that is like you, is in very important in queer dynamics and queer relationships is that because that hierarchy doesn't exist as much because uh, because of how the queer history with marriage was, how queer relationships work in general, like in the newness of the out lifestyle, what that really means is that relationships are kind, a lot of queer people are inherently relationship arch- um, anarchists, which means that, that every relationship is on its own level. That you can still have that nuclear family and that goal, but queer relationships are inherently like the platonic relationship is just as important as the romantic relationship. They're, they're, I wouldn't say they're, they're non-hierarchical. I think that's very they're difficult not to non, achieve in no, reality, yeah. but they're, but they're less hierarchical. Yes. I would say and, that's, and that's had, probably true. They've had to be because they don't, I mean, white supremacy still exists and that's a huge part of it, but it's also patriarch. Like it's part, of, it's part of the patriarchy as well. And so when you have, you know, we're, you're playing into it less because you don't fit the norm. Uh, it still exists and it's still something that society pushes on people and probably will become more defined the longer that the that re- queer relationships can be represented in the media, can be accepted by the wider society. Uh, that will be a change that we see is that things will become hierarchical or more hierarchical. But right now, this show kind of speaks to that queerness because yeah. of that. Yeah, no, you're making a lot of sense, Garnet. Don't need no man. No, you do not. (laughs) But let's actually talk about when you do need a man. (laughs) All right. Mamoru and Usagi. We have a lot of relationship inadequacy going on with these two in this season. But it's a switch, which is so nice to see. Yes. Okay. So Sailor Moon um, last season unlocked Super Sailor Moon. Okay. So she is very powerful at this point. Very, very powerful. And Mamoru kind of sees this. And wonders if he's holding her 
back. That if he's a reason that she is not achieving her true potential, because he sees her like achieving these leaps and bounds and just going and going and going. And it seems like there is no ceiling to her power. And Mamoru is not like that, okay? Like, yes, he has powers in his own right, but like, let's be honest, it is nothing compared to Sailor Moon. It's nothing even compared to the Inner Guardians. You know, um, he 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 is on his own trajectory, on his own path that um, that is really not the same thing at all. And so he starts feeling very inadequate, like wondering, am I holding my girl boss wife back? Um, maybe I am actually. <laughs> and, uh, and poor thing, and poor thing, it's part of, I think, what causes the curse to bloom inside of him. Mm-hmm. Um, cause he oh, starts definitely. to wonder if he's really worth it. Yeah. And it's, uh, again, like relating this to a relationship cycle. I think that this is a very normal part is that when you're integrated so much into a relationship, you start questioning necessarily what you bring to the other person, especially yeah. if the other person is like, succeeding on their own that you for, like part of the support that is built into your life at that point it's easy to forget that that's like not an inherent thing that if mm-hmm. that she is as strong as she can be because she has him to rely on like that yeah. she can rely on him that she can lean on him in the times of need and that she has and like that is something that he is completely forgotten in some yeah. aspects and feels really inadequate for it and not in a not in a like toxic masculinity way, which is beautiful because a lot of times when men are represented of feeling inadequate with their female partner, it's there's a lot of anger involved. There's a lot of anger towards the other person, a resentment of the their growth and the lack of like personal growth on the man's part. None of that exists in this relationship. Mm-hmm. He just is kind of sitting there and being like, "Am I?" Am I hindering, am I hurting, hurting, or am I supporting? And I don't know what that looks like anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Garnet, I, I totally agree. I think what Mamoru goes through is a lot more realistic to when this sort of things happen, this sort of thing happens in real life. Mm-hmm. Not that like um, a man's resentment can't easily turn into anger because that's absolutely true as well. But I don't think it's the default for most people. No. I think most people, when they're initially having these feelings, they react more like Mamoru, where they become kind of like, closed off and like starting to like sneak away from the um the relationship i think that's like that's far more um common than kind of the the violent angry reaction yeah. and i that should, you might typically see and i should clarify that when i'm talking in media representation not oh, necessarily yeah, yeah, yeah. in every life when you have this particular plot line played out in media because of because of of the way that the world works and how we view men in relationships and Mm -hmm. how we view people in relationships that typically is the way that it's represented is that resentment yeah and that happens Um, in in real life too it does yeah in my experience in in my experience as somebody that it tends to be an achiever (laughs) i i tend to be an achiever um more (laughs) so than the others that i surround myself with um, not, uh, it, it's just, it, it's, it has more to do with me than, than with, um, than with them. Uh, this is more the, what memory goes through is more the reaction I see from my friends, yeah. family, and loved ones, as opposed to the anger. I think most people react more like Mamaru yes. does when they're actually faced with, um, the powerful girl boss. Um, so I just, I appreciate seeing that portrayed. Yeah. I also think, yeah, I think it's less portrayed, I think as far as realism of how people respond, it matters the kind of person too. If you are with a high achiever, uh, if you are two high achievers who are together, that's not always the easiest kind of relationship, (laughs) Uh, but it it can cause a lot of not great communication because people take it personally. If you're with the supportive kind of boy, the golden retriever boyfriend that Mamoru is, (laughs) <laughs> then you you do have that level of like inadequacy and that and represented in this way and it is so nice to see it played out in tv played out in a healthy way and communicated healthily yeah because in the end usagi is able to convince mamaru that actually you are powerful too and you're not holding me back you're supporting me you got a crystal inside you too okay it's mm-hmm. not just me you also have a crystal inside of you you're we all have right. crystals inside of us 
And okay. Swaggy is like, you're absolutely right. I don't need a man, but I want a man. And that's oh. why you're here. And I love you so much. And you support me. And you've always have been. Mm-hmm. And Remember, nice. Sailor Moon at its core is a romance. It's it nice to romance. be able to say, see Usagi, like knowing Usagi went through all of these different aspects of the relationship with Mamoru um, and being able to see her be the person who's supporting him for the first time. Not only does it give us great character development on him, but it lets us see Usagi as who she is and who she's growing to be. Yes, absolutely. Hi, Dragon. Thank you so much for that pun. That was hilarious. <laughs> Ooh, love a pun. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so we've got this whole relationship cycle. I'm so excited to see what they do with stars um, after seeing what they well, have done with the all the other arcs. So, go, um, really didn't curious. They kill, didn't really. they? Didn't they kill him off? Like he disappears for a season with stars in the original. I think. Um, I'd have to go back and reread it to tell you it's been a minute. I think so. Oh, I so remember that because I was like, "Where's where's my boy? Where's my boy?" <laughs> Uh, the entire season we'll see we'll see what happens yeah we'll see how they adapt it I'm very curious I'm very curious because I really enjoyed the way that they adapted um Mamaru's feelings of well, inadequacy yeah. Garnet said Garnet says he's MIA too okay I must just not remember yeah. you must be right because you two of y'all think, are saying it but I think also if I remember correctly Garnet correct me if I am pulling this from memory this is also the last dubbed season yeah. of of no, the original 90s that's true. Uh, when I when I watched this anime, it was subtitled downloading the episodes online for Star's yeah. Arc. So I think Star's Arc, I think it'll be interesting to see how it is changed and how it's related. And obviously we'll, we'll be watching it subbed, but it'll be interesting. Yeah, All right. Very, very interesting. Um, shall we get <clears throat> to our next theme? Yes. So in re- it, it also, it's about relationships in relation to domesticity. Okay. So- much queer representation happening and all the also polyamorous for that representation happening with this domestic triad with their baby you know what i loved about it okay so most of y'all know but just for anybody that needs a little refresher on the the deep care and terry lore okay i'm married (laughs) i have a husband all right um we're together there's there's the ring um and then we have a roommate that uh that has been friends with my husband they were friends in high school and, uh, and they've remained friends. He eventually moved in with us and has never left and he has no plans to leave. This is, okay, this is us, okay? Like, I'm I'm Michiru and my husband is Haruka, okay? And um, and the our roommate is Setsuna and then um, all of the cats are baby Otaru. <laughs> I love it, I love it. It's millennial living, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also, I mean, it also can just be like- Hey, you know, that's true. Well, that's true. We could not afford to own a house if it were not for Jeff. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> praise, praise be Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but no, I think that, that it's also just an interesting form of family. Like, again, not the queer representation here is Sailor Moon at its core is found family, right? Like, that mm-hmm. is one of the tropes that is prevalent throughout. It's one of the best quotes, uh, tropes for, for that, like, queer kids specifically really relate to and then all of a sudden you have this like triad of three badass people two of them can canonically queer one of them gender fluid raising child baby all together all being parent figures just truly amazing (laughs) my girlfriends and i are thinking of getting a townhouse there garnet do it three incomes is like is gold okay and here's how you should set it up okay whatever this isn't about sailor moon i don't care here's how you should set it up um two two big incomes but the third person just needs to do a side income so that they can help take care of the house everyone needs a wife that's what i'm saying everyone needs a wife one of you be the wife um it's the best it's the the best living situation anyway (laughs) i wish i had hey two people come join I <laughs> would love it. Thank you. Start Being your commune. Sounds great. <laughs> Start your commune. But yeah, you should totally do it. Get a townhouse together. Go for it. Yep. Um, but domesticity is all over this uh this part of um of Sailor Moon. We have um we have like the begin the whole like introduction segment of the second movie is uh is these four. 
you know, the outer guardians all living together and dealing with Hotaru all of a sudden is growing up very, very fast. Like, oh my gosh, how did that happen? Right. Um, so, so we've got like, a, it's like in, in the middle, in the very middle, we've got domesticity, but it, it starts before then too, with Usagi and Mamoru, they are incredibly comfortable together. They are so comfortable together that Usagi goes and spends the night at Mamoru's house and clearly all the time. And her parents think this is like a, a nice thing and like how, how cool, um, that she can, that she can do this and, uh, and support her boyfriend. Right. Um, so like <laughs> it's, it's, it's throughout, it's throughout They're they're in, they're in domestic bliss. Um, and then whenever we get to like Usagi and Mamoru's fake nightmare dream, it is them like reverting to children. <laughs> and then they realize that, oh, wait, wait, that's not what we actually want. Let's go back to the adult domestic bliss. <laughs> and like also it was like, I, I loved Usagi's point of view of, of like him just taking care of everything and not having to like work. So it was like, it was this weird thing of of her also like being like, no, I also want to be a part of contributing to this relationship, to this life that we are building. Mm-hmm. Um, not just be the person that's being taken care of all the time. Mm-hmm. I want to take care of you too. Yeah. Which is, and it so is it's really sweet. Like they're, when they're kids, like he makes her breakfast and stuff. And it's like really cute. Really, really cute. <laughs> Um, now, one of the domestic relationships that we also have is the Queen Serenity and King Endymion. And I, I think the only the only regret is that, like, I wish we got a, a little bit more of them. But um, but I feel like they're kind of like they're kind of like backseat a little bit in this particular season. But they are still there because we get a flashback, of course, of um, what I keep calling Usagi's um, baptism as a as a baby. Um, but that's not what's happening. I just can't remember what they call it. They call it something else. Um, but I don't know. It looks like a baptism to me, whatever. <laughs> it's real. It's real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, and it's, and they also like are the pinnacle ideal of domesticity. Like they have been consistently through the entire series. Yeah. Um, that you have, they have the kid, they have this kingdom, they have this moment in time and kingdom that was supposed to be basically paradise uh and then not only that but the prior life they also come from two versions of paradise so like it really is this like overtone of domesticity Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah i guess it is kind of like what they're doing in the lion king although i don't know if i was going to give a name to what happens to simba in the lion king i would call that his baptism too I don't know. What do you call a non-religious baptism? There's, is, there's, is there an English, a, a blessing, I guess? I don't know. Is there an a English blessing word for a or ceremony like that? Um, cleansing. I don't know. Anyway, something like that. Yeah. Introduction to the kingdom somehow. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just, I love it. I love how many scenes we have of Usagi and Mamoru in their pajamas hanging out at his place. Um, and it makes it that much more sad whenever Mamoru starts getting sick and he starts being like, um, sorry, go ahead. A, a debut, sorry. A debut, yeah. a debut. Yeah, a um, debut. It is a debut. Her debut. Um, it makes it even more sad when Mamoru is like, no, Usagi, get away from me. I don't want you to see me sick like this. It'll spread the curse. But it turns out that her getting away from him actually is what um, spreads the curse too, because it's just her worry. She's going to worry about him no matter what and spread the curse. So I think also the the domesticity um theme in here is another piece that i think is what contributes to it feeling very kid friendly and childlike because what do kids know kids know living in a domestic situation with their parents you don't really even realize um that there are other configurations other than a parent and children living in a, a house or an apartment or something you don't really realize that there are other configurations of how to live until kind of later on in life. Um, you know, it, it just yeah. doesn't, when you're really young, it doesn't, I don't think it occurs to most kids that like someone could live on their own. I mean, it probably does in like a very high level sense, but not really. They don't know what that looks like. Yeah. I think that there, and there's a difference between knowing and understanding too. So yeah. like you can know that people have, you know, two mommies, two daddies, one mom, things like that. Right. Uh, but un- then being able to actually like understand the implications of what mm-hmm. that means is also a very different thing. 
Yeah. And I think kids probably don't have a concept also of what it, it means to live like with friends. Um, no, they or... can't development. They can't developmentally understand that because they can't yeah. form those kinds of bonds and relationships at that point. Um, nope. So, so the, the, the heavy emphasis on what, you know, home life looks like for these characters, I think also is, is a big part of what makes this feel so, um, so like much younger than the other seasons of Sailor Moon that we've gotten, especially younger off of the heels of the heavy political implications of season three. Congress should have watched this part of the arc. We'd have gay parental rights legalized years ago. True, Garnet, true. All they need to do is see how good Mitru and um, Haruka are at raising baby Hotaru together um, with Setsuna helping them. That's all they need to see. World peace achieved. Watch Sailor Moon. <laughs> Ish. There's a lot of there's a lot of world ending thing happening for world peace to be achieved. That's it. That's, that's really true. Nice. That's true. I'm I'm and I'm sure that there is some kind of like right wing Sailor Moon fans that can pull all of the conservative um, ideals out of Sailor Moon and say that it's supporting that. But you know what? We're not here for them, so oh, we're not so going to do that. <laughs> but all I'm right. sure it exists. I'm sure it exists. Yeah, don't yep. like it. All right, let's get into the them dreams. Okay, so um, just like we talked about at the beginning with the favorite things, um, each of the girls goes through having their goals corrupted. And the whole point of this is that dreams and goals can be scary. Okay, so I think Ray is a really good example of this. So she runs the shrine with her grandfather and her grandfather is getting quite old. They acknowledge that in this arc that um, he is likely not in a position where he's actually going to be able to run the shrine much longer. You know, he's getting old enough where either he's going, it's implied anyway, that either he's going to pass away or he's going to become too feeble to be able to do that. And Ray really wants to take it over. She values her spiritual life very, very much. That Shinto part of her identity um, is very important to her. So she um, she really wants to take over the shrine and just like run the shrine. She's not worried about uh, finding romance. She's not worried about creating a family. She's not worried about some kind of money-making career. She really just wants her spiritual life to be the main part of her life. And so in her dream, um, Tiger's Eye comes around looking all sexy and is like, don't you want a hubby though? Like, you're so pretty. You're so pretty. Don't you want to just get married? You'd make a beautiful bride. And she's like, oh, I don't know. Actually, that would be a lot easier life than running a shrine. Running a shrine is hard and it's not necessarily what is accepted by most people. People are going to question me. But, you know, if I just get married to a hot guy, um, nobody's going to think that that's like a weird life. They're going to be like, I totally get it. And my life's going to be so much easier. And um, and uh, and and so this is like the corruption of her dream and and all of them go through it. And so um you have this kind of like uh goals are important and goals are good, but goals can also be very scary. Yes. Um and I we talked about like this idea of facing fears previously in in previous episodes we talked about also like the meaning of dreams in previous episodes and I feel like that this was just a great combination of all of them that it really does have to do with goals and like facing those fears and then overcoming them and deciding something else and sticking to your conviction which is something that is like a consistent theme with the scouts through all of this of of like that nope this is what I want this is what I'm going to have and I really, I really like it. Like it's, I get, I think that like being able to connect all the dots of four seasons together really is what made this feel so much better than this, than just like redoing this idea of a villain picks a scout, they reflect each other, the scout overcomes it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I that wish, still kind of happens, but yeah. not as much. I wish that they had been integrated a lot more um, mm. and not episodic. I mean, I, that goes back to like the writing. I think that, that, that the theme that we see in all of these could have been more powerful if it happened 
If it was episodes instead of a movie, so that we actually got to if it was digest. Episodes, if it was episodes instead of a movie, or they just took the first 40 minutes or 30 minutes and had it all happen at the same time, where they're all going through the same thing at the same time and we're watching it all at the same time. So they're all mm-hmm. overcoming it at the same time. So that theme mm-hmm. really stands out. Mm, that would have been a way to do it. Yeah, that, that would have been a way to it do it. It would have followed, it would have followed the three-act structure. It would have followed like how themes typically are represented in things. Um instead of us like watching it happen over and over again. They, they would have had getting... to make, yeah, they would have had to make some changes to how each of them ends and have yes. like, yeah, but I think that that could have, you're right. I think that could have helped. That could have helped quite a lot. It would have also made them feel, even though they're separated, it would have made them feel integrated. Like it would have made them feel like the scouts are all going through the same thing together, even though they're yeah. all separate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I would have changed the timeline of certain things, like in regards yes. to what the what Usagi is doing at the same time and what's going on with the the um, the circus that's going on. So they would have had to make a couple of core changes, but that would have made the theme a lot more strong. I think that that's that's definitely true. It's it's one of those changes that in order to make this a successful movie, right? Yeah, like, and fit not the medium better to fit the medium better. Yep, yep, yep. Or yep. have made it episodes and us spend longer with each scout. Yeah not do a movie but they wanted to release it in the theaters and make more money yes and talk, i'm sure that they it, did but that yeah, was my I'm main sure. thing with the with this particular idea mm-hmm. yep for sure for sure um yeah yep. also we got our we got our cute little body swap down here at the bottom oh, so cute <laughs> it's so cute when they like okay so like this is basically from my perspective what happens um Usagi is getting stronger and more powerful and she is like gosh I wish I could go back to a more innocent time so I could just focus on like you know my romance with Mamoru and and my friends and things and uh, and Shibusa is uh, is like wow I want to be stronger and grown up and and beautiful and all, and all of these things and they body swap and it's like they almost instantly have regrets and they're like oh no 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 put it back put it back put it back put ah uh, put it back put it back um dislike back. not into it <laughs> <laughs> Which is character growth for Shibuya, mm-hmm. also character re- growth for Usagi. I also think it's like just really sweet and cute that they uh, <laughs> that they like Freaky Friday it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> for lack of a better <laughs> word, but they they did and they they learned their lesson really quickly, um, and they learned that no, nope, the other life is not better. I think that it also helps reach all age audiences because we've Mm -hmm. all felt that way as a kid we've Mm -hmm. all wanted to grow up faster and as adults or betting adults we've all wanted to be like man I wish I could go back to when I was this age and not have to worry about bills or a mortgage or this that and the other thing yeah Um, I don't know that I've ever wanted to go back to be a kid but I've definitely thought before like um I wish I could go back to college (laughs) I've not thought about going back to college but that's because I (laughs) Well, you had a little bit of a different experience with college. Um, But I definitely like a time where there was less responsibility or less high stakes. Yes. Like as you become an adult and the more responsibility you take on, the more detrimental mistakes become. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that Mm -hmm. is a lot of stress to sit there and be like, man, I can't fuck up in my job because if I fuck up in my job, there goes my car and my mortgage and this and that and the other thing, right? Uh, Whereas when you're a teenager, you're like, I don't care if I show up two hours late to a shift. What are they mm-hmm. going to do? Fire me? Fine. Yeah. It's fine. I'll get another job in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I'll walk into the place next door and get a job for yeah. the same pay and the same hours. Exactly. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no problem. Um, and I, and I also, and I also think of it the other way. Like, I can't remember, I honestly can't remember like what my exact thoughts were, but I've definitely seen like the clip of toddlers and tiaras uh, heinous show, but the, point is is that i have seen the clip of it where the yeah where the the girl is like i can't wait to have boobs when am i gonna have boobs and that's like very what chibiusa is saying you know i mean she doesn't say like (laughs) when am i gonna grow boobs but she basically just says like you know i I want to have a woman's body i think that that's beautiful and that's how i see myself and i want that i think that 
there are probably people who have had thoughts like that, but I think that it's easier to like physically, especially in a show that Chibiusa is in the midst of the shit. Yeah. Like she is in the fights. She is doing everything the Sailor Scouts are doing. It's really hard to like sit there and be like, man, I wish I could drive a car. Cause she doesn't care about driving a car. She, no. does, she just cares about being their age. Yeah. Um, but everyone, I think every kid at some point has felt like, I can't wait until I'm 18 or I can't wait until I'm 16 and I can drive and I can pay for everything myself and oh my or God, I have yeah. my own house or whatever, right? It's like that imagining yes. the life that you're going to have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To be used to going through the ebbs and flows of adolescence. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and Usagi yeah. doing it too, going through the ebbs and flows of adult, of, of like, of becoming an adult, mm-hmm. of going from being a, a child to an adult. She's coming of age. Yep. And if you think about it, like, I'm sure it would be the same thing in reality. Like we think about like us as adults being like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to return to a time when we had less responsibilities and we were younger or whatever. And, you know, the second that that happened and we were like, well, wait a second. But now I don't have my job where I make a decent salary and now I don't have my house. And now I, you know, I have to share my car. And now yeah. uh, it's like, I oh, my God, ato- like going back to a kid, like being like, you have no choice. You have no autonomy at all as a child. No, <laughs> no. Any autonomy you thought you had was like just because your parents were like you know that they were they were um decent to you in general or that day or whatever uh you don't really have autonomy uh legally or culturally you no. know children are basically owned by their parents <laughs> yeah we did we said the same time. like you're like man gotta legally go to school have to be you know beholden to the adults there you have no autonomy you have no choice in your matter which is why not really so many- why so many kids have issues as adults. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are definitely uh, more in favor of like kids. Kids should have more autonomy. I think that we we don't set them up for success. But even way, then, but, like know. in the obviously in the system, yes. But even then, it's like your job as a parent is to keep that kid alive. And if that kid is making a choice, it's not going to kill him. Like you do have to take away the autonomy of making bad choices because kids can't don't have the development processes to understand consequences. Yep. Like sometimes it's good <laughs> that you don't let the child touch the hot stove. Yes. yes. <laughs> or like, like, or be like, oh, they can make any decisions and make mistakes on their own. No, they can't. Because you know what teenagers decide to do? They decide to jump off of buildings because they think they can fly because they're idiots. And uh, that yeah. results badly. <laughs> <laughs> be a little, a little, maybe touch bit hyperbolic there, but pretty close. I mean, I remember some really stupid ideas that my, uh, my friends and, and I had um, as teenagers, <laughs> balance. Uh, some of my friends were balancing on the edge of of buildings because they thought they wouldn't fall. <laughs> mm, mm, mm-hmm. And so it's like, yep. no, no, you're an idiot. Because it's kind of adult. like. It's kind of like how every every um, cruise season you hear it of at least like one person who fell off the cruise ship because they thought that they could balance on on the edge of the balcony or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> it's like and that, what? And like, man, that ch- that person probably sixteen years old. Like you're just like- probably usually. I I think for the most part they're usually either a teenager or they were very drunk. <laughs> yes. Because being drunk makes you a teenager. It's it's amazing yeah, what true. happens. That's true. <laughs> So, right. so a big theme in the, in the dream arc is those dreams and thinking about like, if this is really the dream that, that I want, um, and going through other choices. And I think that we, we all do this in our adolescence to some extent, like, well, what happens if I don't achieve my dream? What happens if I go for the easier path instead of what I really want? And, uh, and, uh, the villains of course, turn those into nightmares in a very like fantasy setting, but this is still something super relatable that all kids go through. I think there's also like a level of understanding that the dreams and goals that we follow require sacrifice. Yes. I think we see that specifically in Ray where she like, you have to, you have to sacrifice. You don't have to, but, but in order to rule this, in order to, be a, a be the leader of a temple in order to have that be your high priority it means other things do fall to the wayside you can't and have everything you, you can't, can't have, everything. have everything and the idea of being a child and imagining a life in which you do have everything is incredibly normal so hearing the lesson of you can't have everything in a digestible way in a way that most children can empathize with is incredibly it, and smart and is a huge theme of this. Yeah. 
Yep. Yep. Sure is. All right. Okay. Well, well, that brings us to the final question. Oh my gosh, we're finishing up the Sailor the Sailor Moon uh, deep dives here for right now. We are. We'll have to see. We'll have to okay. do these. Do do the last one again in twenty twenty three. Yes. Um. But yeah. So Landon, does the Crystal's version of Dream Arc with Sailor Moon Eternal did it resonate? In some ways, yes. Uh, not nearly as much as the previous, but I think that that has to do with the writing. I am such a sucker for like overall story structure and writing and character development. And because of how it was presented to me, I had a really tough time resonating with it uh, until we started like really deep diving it. So on like first watch, not really. On secondary watch, a little bit more. Um, but I think that like, those lessons that we eventually learn, the development of relationships, like all those things that we really did dig deep into once you like mine it really did start to resonate. Mm -hmm. What about mm -hmm. you, Karen? Did it resonate with you? So I would say I had a similar reaction. The answer is yes, but with a big asterisk, not as much as any of the other seasons. Yeah. And I do think the structure is why it took a lot more brain power for me to grasp what the themes were. I had to actually spend time thinking about my experience in of the dream arc in the manga and in the nineties anime and like, Oh wait, how did they adapt this part or that part? Like it didn't jump out at me as super obvious the way that like the whole point of each season prior to this did. Right. Oh, we went backwards. That's okay. Right. Um, so I just feel like, like, yes, but like, it could have been so much better if they had just made episodes. Um, cause I don't dislike this arc. I think it's really cool. I think the villains are the best villains of Sailor Moon by far. They are my favorite group of villains. Um, I love that everybody gets, uh, princess powers. I love that the culmination of this is everyone has a power crystal inside of them. Like I just, there are things about the dream arc that I really, really love, but I think that the way that crystal conveys it because it's in a two part movie is it's weak. It's weak compared to other seasons of crystal. It's weak compared to yeah. other versions of this same arc. It's like over, it's like overstimulation almost of like so much, is so much is happening. I can't process one thing at a time and therefore everything kind of mutes. Yes. That's how I feel. That's how I feel. Yes. I understand. Yeah. Um, but I think that there are still really important lessons and some really important things that are happening in this, in this show. So definitely worth the watch. Uh, mm -hmm. And it will be interesting to see because they are producing a movie for the two do we remember what it was called no it's the, the stars arc so the stars the arc st is going to be i can't yes. remember what they're calling the movie um but it's gonna it's the stars arc they're gonna do it and they're gonna do a two-part movie just like they did for um eternal that's what they're working on so it's gonna be the same thing i'm curious if the structure will still feel cosmos. jacked up cosmos okay cosmos thank you oh garnet said it at the same time yes thank you guys cosmos so i'm really curious how i'll feel about the stars arc in crystal compared to the stars arc in the manga and in the 90s anime um i'm curious if i'll feel the same way of like oh i love the stars arc but maybe not this adaptation <laughs> i also think it'll be it'll be interesting for me because this will be the first time going into it where i have very little living memory of stars mm. arc i know because yeah, there was no things. there was no dub but there was no dub. I, I think I watched it sub once when I was a teenager, but I, it was certainly by the time, like, by the time I binge watched it, my, like, I was like, I couldn't keep binge watching after a certain point. Mm. So like, I never like really finished everything. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see, like, to get it almost fresh. Yeah. Uh, in a way that none of the other seasons have been for me. So. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, it'll be interesting. I think, uh, yeah. the sailor stars arc is a fan favorite for a lot of people, just like how this, uh, the dreams arc is a favorite for a lot of people. The stars arc is a favorite for a lot of people. So I'm really, really curious how it's going to go. Really curious. We'll see. Well, until then you got us 
every Saturday. Okay. <laughs> so, every Saturday. so before, before we talk about where you can find us, I just want to yes. remind everybody, I've got two people in the raffle right now, but we have time to put some more. We, we have stickers. Okay. I'm going to produce some, some real ones that will sell for, for Christmas. However, um, the samples, I got to do something with them. Okay. I can't just have stuff in my house to have stuff in my house. I want to give them away. I want to give them away to you guys. We're going to give one away. This particular stream, um, all you have to do is tell us which Sailor Moon movie is your favorite. So let me know, and I'll be happy to send you a pack of stickers. Um, oh, we've got, I've got Sailor Garnet. I saw your entry. Um, Anime Girl Super Kawaii. I saw your entry. If anybody else would like to get entered in that, uh, you know, please tell us in the next like two or three minutes as we're talking about our outro. Oh, Alpha Tiff, Sailor Moon R. A woman after my own heart. Sailor Moon oh. R. I watched that movie probably like six times. I had it on DVD. My friend borrowed it and I never got it back and I was so mad. Um, but uh, yeah, Sailor Moon R with the alien dude. Like, oh my God, that was great. That was great. Okay, Alpha Tiff, got you. All right, a few more minutes for everybody if you want to get in um, while we talk about where to find us. So you can find us right here, of course, on Twitch. Next week, we're going to be ranking every Sailor Moon Crystal villain. Can't wait to do a ranking episode with you guys. As you guys know, we do that on Tier Maker, and uh, you'll be able to rank along with us if you would like to do that. Uh, so next Saturday, that's going to be the episode, ranking every Mo Sailor Moon Crystal villain. Um, also I stream on Thursdays. That is the stream by myself. During those streams, we focus on games with good stories, cozy games, things like that. And it's spooky month. So for spooky month, we're going to be playing monster prom. So let's get ready to smash some monsters. Okay. We're going to be super problematic. We're going to smash some high school monsters. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to have a really good time for spooky month. We're going to be playing that every single week in October. And depending on how far we get, we might play it a little bit into November. We'll see. I don't know. Um, also, you can find all of the VODs. Uh, you can find all of the VODs of my episodes of both Inner Stage Window and Artistic License on my YouTube channel. So you're welcome to go ahead and subscribe to that. You can find all of the past episodes, especially the ones we've referenced today. I know we mentioned we have a, we have a Matrix episode with the original as well as the sequels. We have, um, we have a, a, what was that one show? Um, with the, the light and the dark magic. I think if you like Sailor Moon, you probably like our episode of that. That's more like problematic romance. You, bro you mean Shadow and Bone? Yeah, Shadow and Bone, Shadow and Bone. We have an episode of Shadow and Bone that you would like. We've got all the three seasons um, prior of Sailor Moon Crystal that's on the channel. Harry Potter, more find than 24 there. hours of content for Harry Potter. <laughs> Since I told Landon that her mind has been blown. Yes, we have more than 24 hours of Harry Potter content. If you were a were or are, understand why you might be a were, um, a Potterhead, then uh, then we we got the hookup. We got the hookup for you. And uh, there's more coming. We will be doing the final book before the end of the year. Don't you worry. It's just like a fun thing to say to my friends that I can and have spoken about Harry Potter for more than 24 hours. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yep. Um, and uh, my main social media is Twitter, so you can always find all the updates there if any kind of, um, hell, fuck, yeah, Ravenclaw gang, woo, call, call, motherfuckers. Um, What's as good as Slytherin? So, <laughs> uh, yep, you can, you can find all the latest updates on Twitter, so if there's ever any changes to streams or things like that, looking at my Twitter feed is the, the place to go. Uh, also, if you want to make sure that you have all the latest updates, uh, uh, sorry, not updates. If you have all the latest notifications, you want to get in my Discord server because I actually control the notifications there as opposed to trusting Twitch and YouTube to actually notify you when things go up. So that's all the places you can find me. Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Land in Maine. Um, and in my bio of my Instagram, I have my uh, Amazon wish list for my classroom. I teach sixth graders and my school has recently basically said that they will not be purchasing books for us. So our classroom libraries to be completely self-funded and uh I, kids deserve diverse stories in schools and access to it so if you have and are willing to help out please do don't feel like you have to but that is down there yep so you can find that on landon's instagram um and help out her kids if you would like to do that okay so before we end i'm actually gonna drag this over and, and cover up the slideshow for just a second Yee. um but here we go Okay, we're gonna do we're gonna do the wheel. We're gonna do the wheel for for winning the stickers. Let me make sure everybody can see that. Everybody can see that. Okay, so um, where's the button? Oh, there it is. Okay, you just click to spin. All right, here you guys go. Let's see who's gonna win. I like the noise this thing makes. It's very satisfying. <laughs> All right, Alpha Tiff. 
Alpha Tiff, congratulations. Um, if you didn't win, don't worry. There will be uh, more chances. We will do some other. We'll do some other fun giveaways with the stickers uh, throughout the month of October. So Alpha Tiff, I think you already are in the Discord server, but just in case you're not, please hop in the Discord and um, either at me or DM me so that I can get a good address to send those stickers to you. And congratulations on your winning. Oh my God, is that a Luna? Is that a Luna yeah. emoji alpha tip? Oh, that's so cute. It's so cute. You're in the Discord. Okay, so um, ping me or DM me, whichever way, get my attention in some way. And, uh, and I will reach out to you for that information um, a little bit on later on this afternoon. Okay, there we go. We're good with that. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for, um, for joining us today. Let's find someone to raid. Let's find someone to raid. Who are we going to raid today? Who are we going to raid today? Ghostbusters! <laughs> I did kind of say it with that cadence, didn't I? You did. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we going to raid? Um... <laughs> Oh my gosh, I don't have I don't have a lot of friends in there. Let me see. Let me see what we can do. Friends! Yeah. Where are you? They're all oh. they're all doing other stuff, I guess. Not streaming right now. Oh. Let's see if there's any in my team. Let's see if there's any wolves. I'm I'm the only wool online too. Okay. Oh wait. Ha! Ah, Ariel just went live. Ariel <laughs> fabulous. She took a long stream break, you guys, and just a couple of weeks ago finally came back. Um, she's a great streamer. She is, um, so here's her, here's kind of her stick with streaming. She's a baby gamer. So she never started playing video games until she was an adult. She was, so she has no idea what she's doing and, uh, and is having a great time learning. Um, so we're going to raid, we're going to raid her. All right. Raid Ariel fabulous. Okay. There we go. All right. Raid is going. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, guys. See you later. Bye.